live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. New at 6, the homes of two families damaged by fire in Southeast Bear County. Firefighters called to the 8400 block of South Loop 1604 East for a shed fire. Officials say the wind caused those flames to spread to two nearby houses. The families that live there were able to make it out safely, but the homes were damaged with the back of one home taking heavy damage. The shed was a total loss. No injuries were reported and the arson unit is investigating. Well, after what Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar called a violent assault, one of his deputies is facing charges. The victim, the deputy spouse. The charge continued violence against a family member. Paul Venema with more on what appears to be the deputy's pattern of violence. It's very disturbing, quite frankly. Sheriff Javier Salazar is talking about allegations against this man, 31-year-old Deputy John Paul Garza, already on indefinite suspension for a February attack on his spouse. Garza was arrested last night for allegedly attacking her again. He knocked her to the ground and kicked her in the face, um, at, at which point, uh, the victim's clothes became soiled with blood. Garza, who normally works patrol, was off duty at the time. Salazar said he tore the woman's clothes from her body in an attempt to remove evidence of the attack. She was able to get up and get away and ran from the house partially uh, clothed in undergarments. Uh, she was able to run next door and ask for help. Gaza fled but was arrested several hours later. The assaults follow another assault case, this one at the jail in 2013. I'm reading documents where he used an inappropriate amount of force on an inmate. Salazar said he's preparing paperwork to have Gaza terminated. He's been on unpaid leave since February. Paul Venom, a case at 12 News. If as expected at tonight's briefing, the San Antonio's uh, COVID hospitalization rate has hit seven straight days at 15%. Restaurants will be among those that'll have to go back down to 50% occupancy. They have been at 75%. But at least now there are some restaurants that have learned to adapt. Luckily, in addition to dine-in, some have drive throughs and are able to do takeout. They say that delivery services and loyal customers who believe in buying local have sustained them. So even if it's takeout or sitting in a restaurant, we'll go out and just do our part to try and support the small businesses. Definitely the less capacity you have, of course, the less business you're going to have. So uh, hopefully we'll get back. We'll get back to normal pretty soon. That restaurant owner says he's been blessed in that he's been able to keep his employees on the payroll and pay all his bills, unlike so many others that couldn't survive. Well, the game is on, but the settings will be different this year for the Valero Alamo Bowl game. Today, officials taking questions from reporters about a safety plan put in place for the reduced number of people who will be attending. Devin Clark with what you need to know if you plan to be there to watch Texas play Colorado tomorrow. For the reduced number of 11,000 fans who will be allowed inside of the Alamo Dome for tomorrow's face-off, facility officials say that they have a strong game plan that includes basic safety principles. Face coverings must be worn properly over the nose and the mouth, except when eating and or drinking at their seat or um, at, at their suite. Officials are asking fans to wash their hands frequently. Six feet social distancing requirements will be enforced inside. Every other row is closed. And outside. There will be no tailgating at this year's event. A mobile food app will offer contactless delivery. The parking management system also requires minimal interaction. We're trying to make it as contactless and touchless as possible. Fans are being asked to do their parts as well. Monitor themselves for any COVID-19 symptoms and stay home if they're sick. If someone does not pass the mandatory temperature check, they will be asked to leave along with their entire group. We will give them instructions to who to call from a medical perspective as well as refund information. While the new guidelines may lead to an unusual bowl game experience this year, facilitators believe safety goals will be met. What UTSA has done with six home games here, no issues at all. This is basically going to be a seventh edition of that. And we have a full list of the guidelines and more information on those contactless services right now on our website, ksat.com. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Last week, we showed you what travel restrictions have done to Laredo's main international bridge downtown. But just take a look at the trade bridge just a few miles away. Although it slowed down initially, Jesse DeGoyano reports the pandemic 
has done little to disrupt Laredo's busiest commercial bridge that's also one of the nation's largest inland ports. Long lines of tractor trailers crossing Laredo's World Trade Bridge are a welcome sight deep into a pandemic. The trade and economy is, 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 still, is still working strong. Even stronger, many say. At times, cross-border traffic estimated as high as 16,500 trucks heading north and south. Early on, though, numbers show it fell from around 15,000 trucks daily to just over 9,000 soon after the pandemic spread to Mexico. Automotive basically closed their plants for a month, almost a month and a half. Now that production has ramped up at many of the larger plants in Mexico, parts and products on board those trucks are once again coming through warehouses in Laredo for distribution throughout the U.S. St. Joe, Missouri, this merchandise goes to Denver, various other locations. This was going to New Jersey. Everything from brooms to tequila, he says, even PPE and medical supplies. Also toilet paper, believe it or not, coming out of Mexico because of the shortages here in the United States. He says much of whatever Americans may need or want, especially now, must cross here first. U.S. Customs and Border Protection there to try to make sure it's done safely for everyone's protection. It's something that, that's vitally important to us. Um, to, to protect the, the country, to protect the, uh, the economy. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says they're in desperate need of blood donations. While December is usually a slow month for blood donations, the coronavirus pandemic has made getting donations even more challenging. Officials say they want everyone to know that if you've been given a coronavirus vaccine, you can still give blood. So we um, received some guidance from our regulatory agencies, allowing us to bring in donors who had had a COVID vaccine previously. So if a person out there gets a COVID vaccine, the Moderna or the Pfizer, there's no waiting period. The blood center is looking for donors of all blood types, but especially need those with O blood. If you'd like to schedule an appointment to donate, just visit SouthTexasBlood.org. San Antonio police searching for a group of suspects who put in an awful lot of work trying to get into an ATM at a Northside bank early this morning. They were unsuccessful. Officers responded to the Chase ATM in the 3700 block of Colony Drive around 445 this morning. According to police, the suspects had two or three vehicles there, including one that was stolen out of Von Army. Officers say they had a chain tied to one of the automobiles to pull the security bars and padlock off, but they couldn't get into the safe. One of the suspect vehicles was found at a car wash in the same parking lot. Another found nearby, still running with a broken chain, still attached to the bumper. There were no signs of the suspects, though. A motorcyclist rushed to the hospital in critical condition after an overnight crash in Leon Valley. It happened around midnight in the 5400 block of Grissom Road. According to police, the driver lost control of the motorcycle and crashed into a curb. He was found on the sidewalk, unresponsive, and taken to University Hospital. Let's take a look at time saver traffic on this Monday evening at 281 in San Pedro. Light traffic out there, as you would expect. Many people off this week for the continuing holiday as we head into the final days of 2020. Adam? Final days of 2020. Yeah. Let's hope everything is brighter and better by Hopefully Friday. It brings us some nice weather too. And when I say nice, I yes. wet. <laughs> okay, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and that's the headline here. Yeah. Is we're looking at good rainfall potential right before the new year. So it's nice to see this in the forecast. Today we started out at 53 and then had a high temperature near 80. 78 the high temperature. So well above average. And it's going to be warm for now. New Year's Eve, completely different story. We're still at 72, dew point of 57, southeasterly breeze at 17. You definitely notice the wind out there. You have today, you will the next couple of days. It's coming off the Gulf of Mexico. It's a warm breeze, 73 Port SA, Rio Medina now 71, along with Bull Verde, and some upper 60s in the hill country. Kerrville, for example, at 67, but 76 in Del Rio. Now, as we go through the evening, temperatures just gradually falling off. I think by 10 p.m. we'll still be in the mid to upper 60s. So an unseasonably warm night on the way. Low clouds filling in, 
damp and drizzly later tonight and to start the day tomorrow. So tomorrow's going to be another damp start to the day. Areas of drizzle, some fog as well, some damp roadways and a few sprinkles here and there throughout the day with minimal sunshine into the afternoon, but some breaks in the clouds. Temperature wise 60 in the morning tomorrow, then making it up to 72 for the afternoon high temperature. We could use the rainfall. We all know that we're in a drought. We need the rain aquifer down a little bit today. We're about five and a half feet below the December average, but I do think there is good potential here to boost the aquifer later this midweek. Oh, that's the wrong pollen count. Anyway, mountain cedar is actually high today. Again, it's that time of year where mountain cedar is elevated and usually peaks in January and then leaves us as we get into about Valentine's Day. So we're going to talk about that rainfall potential and maybe even a little bit of a white surprise on the back end of it on Thursday coming right up. Coming up tonight on the night beat discrimination and hate a local transgender woman discusses the uphill battle facing the LGBTQ plus community. It is a part of our series Voices of a Nation. Plus, San Antonio sees longer than average lines at COVID-19 testing facilities following holiday gatherings. Why health experts say this is a good thing. Well, as you heard us say a little bit earlier in this newscast, we'd have several days of a positivity rate of above 15%, so not good news as we're heading into this new work week. And the last briefing we had was on Wednesday, so it'll be interesting to see how things have transpired here over the course of the past We actually didn't see numbers until days. yesterday, yeah. so it's been quite a while. We'll have to see what the news is today. Let's listen in. City Attorney Andy Segovia, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 43 new cases of COVID-19. We shouldn't let our guard down and don't be fooled by this number. Uh, cities across the state uh, were not able to download uh, from the state the data from yesterday. So that number will be updated uh, tomorrow. But those 43 cases were reported directly locally to our uh, Metro Health Department today. Um, we do have no new deaths to report tonight, thankfully. Uh, however, the stress on our local hospital system continues to increase. The percentage of COVID-19 patients in our region's hospitals has remained at 16 or 16% 16 or above for the last few days. As we reported last week, under Governor Abbott's most current state uh, COVID-19 order, GA-13, if an area becomes a high hospitalization area, then any business operation with a 75% occupancy limit under GA 32 is reduced to only 50% occupancy limit. The reduced occupancy limit continues until the area has seven days under 15%. As you may remember, on December 22nd last week, our rate increased to 15.1%, and today marks the seventh day that that rate has remained above 15%. So the new occupancy limits, according to the state's order, will go into effect tomorrow, December 29th, 2020. Businesses impacted by the governor's order include restaurants, gyms, retail, amusement parks, water parks, swimming pools, museums, libraries, zoos, and indoor and outdoor sporting events, uh, sports and events. Bars do remain closed under the governor's order. Businesses exempt by the governor's order include religious services, uh, critical infrastructure services such as grocery stores, pharmacies, and convenience stores, local government operations, child care services, youth camps, recreational sports, public and private schools, and driving concerts and movies. Cosmetology salons, um, hair salons, barber shops, nail salons, massage establishments, and other personal care and beauty services may operate with six feet of distance between workstations. Currently, we have 1,079 patients in our local hospitals tonight. That's up 79 from yesterday. We do have 122 new admissions in the last 24 hours. 299 patients are in the ICU and 164 on ventilators. It is Monday, so let's take a quick look at our progress and warning indicators as well. Our case rate has increased this week to 64.6 per 100,000. And our positivity rate has increased from 14.4% last week to 19.2% this week. I should note that the, that the number of tests declined pretty dramatically last week due to the holiday uh, closures, uh, but our overall risk uh, level remains, excuse me, our overall risk level has increased to severe in our community. Let me turn it over now to Judge Nelson Wool. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And let me say, first of all, I hope everybody. Uh, 
had a nice Christmas. I know it was probably uh, somewhat of a lonely one. I know it was for us, but uh, uh, Christmas is a special time of the year. And now we are heading up toward the New Year's. And what's making this difficult, I think, for all of us is that unlike previous holidays, this is a, you know, stretches out quite a bit. Kids are home from school, goes home for a couple of weeks. And a lot of people probably let their guards down some. But it's a difficult time. And, and uh, something else may be happening that we're not aware of yet. And I'm not sure about it. But when they had the outbreak and... Uh, in uh, Britain, uh, it was going 50% faster than we ever had before because there was a new strand, and now it's spreading around the world. It's gone as far as Australia, could have possibly been here also, and so we're seeing the infection rate uh, really, really spread around the world, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a more dangerous one, but it just means it's easier uh, for the spread to be uh, leading all across the, all across the world now. You know, the hospitals uh, are going to be a challenge for us in the next coming weeks. Uh, that was a huge jump for, what, 69 or so in one day. Uh, 79, excuse me, 79 in one day. And we can probably expect that to go up, as much as I hate to say that. And that does have an impact, on, on certainly on some of the elective surgeries, uh, hospitals and doctors, uh, you know, have some leeway in that, uh, depending on the severity of the need for it. So I would advise you, if you're uh, in line to have a surgery, be sure and talk, check, talk with your doctor and make sure it's of a nature that, that, that can be handled. Uh, we've really uh, getting a lot of outside help. I believe it was only about a, a week, maybe a week and a half ago. Uh, we had something like 600 uh uh, medical uh, technicians and staffing help come into San Antonio. I think as of today, we've got 900 clinical uh, staff that's come in because it doesn't matter if you have a bed open and you don't have staff. So obviously our hospital has been, been pushed beyond their normal limits and we are still in the flu season. So uh, we'll have a challenge. I think uh, certainly the early part of January is going to be very, very hard for us. I want to thank the uh, San Antonio Spurs for canceling their games uh, that they had intended to have fans at. Uh, uh, on January 1, they had put that off and going to be review it again about the middle of December, uh, the middle of January, excuse me, and we'll see what uh, what happens in that. Uh, you know, it's not only because you got a closer arena than you do, say, the big Alamo Dome, and... Uh, it puts not only uh, fans in danger, but it puts our Spurs in danger. And I've watched the last three games. We've got a lot of good, young, strong players, and we certainly don't want to hurt them either. So uh, thank you, Spurs. They didn't have to do this, uh, but they chose to do it, and I appreciate that. Great. Thank you, Judge. And as always, uh, for those of you who are struggling through this pandemic, there is assistance programs available. Uh, for anyone who is uh, struggling paying rent or mortgage, uh, please know that the city and the county have an emergency housing assistance program available to you. All right, the big headline to come out of that briefing today, as expected, the new occupancy limits will go into effect tomorrow. That is due to the rising positivity rates. We've now had seven days of that rate being above 15%, so they will now go from 75% occupancy to 50% occupancy beginning tomorrow. This applies to restaurant, gyms, retails, museums, et cetera. Basically everything yeah. that you can possibly do out there. There were only 43 new cases reported today, but that is because there was a problem with the state reporting system. So they expect those numbers will definitely be higher tomorrow. Lots of cities had difficulty putting in those uh, numbers. So very low today, no new deaths, but the rolling average for seven days now above 1,100. Yeah, we won't see it go back um, to 75% uh, until we are back down seven days consistently under that 15% mark so fingers crossed that everybody did well over the Christmas holiday um, and hopefully uh, some good news here coming out of the um, or rolling into the new year I should say meantime let's turn now to weather 72 degrees out there kind of warm I would say Oh, yes, it is. For this time of year, it is relatively warm. We even made it up to 78 for our high temperature, but we do have a lot to talk about, particularly in terms of our good rainfall potential. And yes, there is the chance of a, an area of a wintry mix in South Texas somewhere on the backside of it, but I don't want that to overshadow 
a drought denting rain. So let's talk about this. It's a big, potent system right now over California. Actually, a good chunk of Southern, Southern California and the desert area seeing moisture with this, even over spreading Arizona and stretching into the plains right now. That's our next system. It's going to barrel our way. And really, the next couple of days are just going to be mostly cloudy again, drizzly in the mornings, a few sprinkles, light showers here and there. That'll be the case tomorrow. By Wednesday, we actually could have a few thunderstorms develop, especially along and east of I-35 and some scattered rain as well. But our highest rainfall potential, when we're expecting the best chance of rain and most widespread rain, that'll be Wednesday night on into early Thursday morning. Now, Thursday morning's also when we'll probably grab some cooler air from the north and pull it into South Texas, and that could lead to a brief changeover to some rain, snow, or even just some wet snowflakes, uh, particularly closer to the Rio Grande or in the Hill Country, and that would be at some point on Thursday. Right now, we're not expecting any big impacts from that, mainly just more of a gee whiz factor, but here's the point. Good rainfall potential. I mean, we're talking one to two inches is the forecast right now in and around San Antonio. You go east of town, closer to Houston. We're thinking greater than two inches of rainfall. All right, tomorrow we'll start the day at 60 degrees, make it up to 72, mainly gray, a little damp. Look how temperatures drop Thursday. We're down in the low 40s for high temperatures. New Year's Eve and Friday clearing in 58. All right, thank you, Adam. I have a look at sports with Greg next. This SA Salutes Holiday Greeting is brought to you by CPS Energy. Hi, I'm Missy with CPS Energy, scheduled at Eastside Service District. Want to say thank you to all of our first responders. I'm wearing red in support of our troops who have yet to make it back home. Thank you and happy holidays. The two head coaches for Texas and Colorado, Tom Herman and Carl Durrell, holding their final press conferences today before they face off in the Bolero Alamo Bowl tomorrow in the Alamo Dome. Longhorns arriving in San Antonio at 4 p.m. today, headed straight to the Alamo Dome for their first workout in San Antonio before tomorrow's big game. The Buffaloes have been here since this weekend. The Horns come into this game at 6-3, and three, due in part to the coronavirus limiting the amount of games they could play. Likewise, for the Buffaloes, who are just 4-1 and one overall. Other teams in the Pac-12 who were eligible for this game decided to opt out, but not Colorado. We were able to get two, two good practices down here and then to walk through the day, so that was really good. The, the, the city of San Antonio has been great for us. I think our players have had a, a good experience, you know, these last couple days. Things are a lot different this year, but, um, you know, we still had a blast preparing for this game, uh, as we always do, getting ready for bowl games. And, um, you know, just really excited to see our guys go out and compete. By the way, the Longhorns junior Joseph Asai was named to the Associated Press All-America first team today. Here's the matchup that you will take place tomorrow in the Alamo Dome. 8 p.m. kickoff for you. It's game week for the fight in Texas Aggies as they prepare to appear in the Orange Bowl in Miami against North Carolina. The Aggies are initially disappointed. They were left out of the college football playoffs, ranked number five by the selection committee, decided to leave in both Ohio State and Notre Dame. But now their focus is on beating the Tar Heels on Saturday, where they are seven-point favorites. It won maybe his final pregame press conference in college football, preparing for perhaps his final game. San Antonio's Kellen Mond was asked if he'd given any thought about returning to play for the Aggies one more season because of the extra year of eligibility given to all seniors by the NCAA during the COVID-19 pandemic. I've thought about it and, you know, it's kind of been something that's talked around the locker room a little bit, but, you know, I think just where everybody's focus is, we just want to win this game. We want to finish off the season strong and um, then kind of move on from there and decide what everybody else is going to do. By the way, the Aggies offensive lineman Kenyon Green was named to the Associated Press All-America second team today. Kickoff between number five Texas and the A&M and number 13 North Carolina is set for 7 p.m. on Saturday. Our San Antonio Spurs are coming off their first loss of the season after a slow start in New Orleans against the Pelicans. That's after winning their first two games against Memphis and Toronto in their new up-tempo style offense. After being down by just two at half, the Pelicans are able to open up a double-digit lead in the third quarter behind Josh Hart's three. But the Spurs come back on a 20-3 run that continues into the fourth quarter as Kelton Johnson is able to find Rudy Gay. Rudy finished with a team high 22 points, puts the Spurs ahead 85-82, but soon find themselves down three with a chance to tie it at the buzzer. But DeMar DeMar Rosen's shot is blocked, and the Spurs fall 98-95. Last play, obviously, they sniffed it out, and we couldn't get what we wanted out of it. I think uh, 
you know, next time if, if, if Lonnie had it, he'd probably get the open too or try to drive and try to find somebody to be open. But, you know, it's a learning experience for him. It's a learning experience for all of us. You know, we're just getting better at the team. All right, and the next up for the Spurs will be a Wednesday game that will be against the Lakers, and they're trying to keep teams from traveling a lot, so they're going to play a Lakers again on New Year's Day here in San Antonio. But as we told you at 5, there will be no fans allowed at that game. And as you heard, the county judge also expressed it looks like they're going to revisit their no-fan policy in middle January. So we'll have to see how that works out. Could be a while. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It is time for our KSAC Q&A segment, and tonight we are joined by Dr. Erica Gonzalez, President and CEO of the South Texas Allergy and Asthma Medical Professionals. Thank you so much for being with us, Doctor. Thank you for having me. By this time, the government had hoped to have vaccinated 20 million Americans. So far, it's only been 2 million, much smaller numbers here locally. What do you think about the rollout of the vaccine so far and how that distribution is going? You know, I think that the government has done a good job at rolling it out. I know that when we got it, um, we were very impressed with uh, how it was packaged and everything that they made sure that they are also shipped to you so that you were ready to go. The problem is that none of us have seen this vaccine before. So logistically, as soon as we got it, we had to make sure that we were able to implement it safely in our clinic. Now, I understand you received at your clinic the Moderna vaccine, but I understand that you're also involved with some of the patient trials for Xarelto. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. So we have been uh, doing the Xarelto study, which is fu uh, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that's one of the ones where they're looking at people who are diagnosed with COVID and trying to get medications like Xarelto uh, at the start of an infection uh, before it hits the point to where patients are so symptomatic it require hospitalization. So we know this is one of the medicines, uh, medication types that they get once they're in the hospital. So we're trying to do it on an outpatient basis. And so um, unfortunately, here in San Antonio, we're seeing so many patients uh, affected by uh, the coronavirus that we've been able to enroll quite a bit for that study. Uh, so we're glad to be helping them out, but we're, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that the problem is here it, for us to have so many people to help. Dr. Fauci has recently said that he believes 85 percent of Americans need to be vaccinated for us to reach herd immunity, for it to be really effective. It is difficult to get people to even take the annual flu vaccine. And there's lots of questions that people have and concerns about this new vaccine. What do we need to do to get people to take this vaccine, take it seriously and, and, and really get a hold of this virus? Yeah, so I think for um, a lot of people, this is very important. They were very anxious. They were waiting for the vaccine to come out. So those were the people that were first in line. They were ready to take it. Then you have those people that are a little bit more hesitant, uh, don't want to be the first in the first round. They want to, you know, have a couple of people get it first that they know before they kind of jump into it. But I think it's important to note that if we're ever going to get back to any sense of normalcy, that this is the first step in us being able to get there. Although it was a quick process uh, to get this vaccination out into um, into the community, uh, it still followed all the FDA regulations that need to be followed when any medication is coming out on the market. So all the safety measures and efficacy measure measures were were met. And so, you know, although uh, it's it's a new medication, it's one that has been vetted, um, and they should know that it, it's safe. And I think that as physicians. We are in the first round of getting the vaccines, and so we should be setting the example, too, by making sure that we're the ones getting it first and showing our patients that if we feel it's safe enough for us to get it, that they should, too. I imagine that the fight against COVID-19 is a battle that's very personal for you. I understand that you, you recently lost someone, um, your mother, in fact, um, to COVID. Um, first of all, my condolences to you and your family, Dr. Gonzalez. But um, I just want to ask, how are you doing? And, and what is your greater message to the San Antonio community? Yeah, so thank you for that. Uh, yes, our family has been uh, personally affected um, in a very... Uh, severe way, lost my mother about three months ago. Um, I do know that uh, right now, if um, if we had the vaccine available three months ago, there'd be no question in my mind that I'd be having both my parents or anybody of my loved ones at high risk to get the vaccine. This vaccine is going to be life-saving. Um, I think that um, even in the, the six months, eight months since the start of the pandemic, we've come such a long way in knowing 
um, how to treat it better, how to manage it better, um, that we should take advantage of that because we didn't have that. And a lot of people lost loved ones because we didn't have what we have available today. So please take advantage of what we have. Uh, it's there to help the community, to help save lives. Don't let it affect your family the way it's affected so many one, so many of us. Doctor, some of the questions I see keep coming into KSAT are uh, obviously first responders are, are at the head of the line here, but they want to know, when will I be able to get in line? When will it be my turn? I'm 80 and I have these underlying conditions or I'm under 65 and I have these underlying conditions. What is your understanding when we get to the next group of people? How will folks be notified and, and what do they have to do to be able to get the vaccine? Is there a line they have to join or what do they need to do? Yeah, so the CDC is kind of um, looking and making the recommendations of how they want to roll this out um, and in the different phases. Um, Texas as a state will um, follow those guidance closely. I know right now we're in the 1A uh, phase, which is our healthcare workers, our frontline workers, um, and soon we'll be rolling out the 1B uh, phase, which we anticipate will be middle to end of January. Um, and so, you know, keep up with the, the Department of State and Health Services through uh, the, the Texas website. They'll be rolling it out. Uh, after this, we will be going to our high risk individuals, those over the age of 65, those who may have other comorbid conditions. Um, I know that the governor is pushing to have our teachers also uh, be in that second batch um, as they are um, exposed uh, when they are at school and so are considered frontline workers as well. Um, and so I think, you know, just kind of monitor that. Um, there's a lot of different places where you can get on a waiting list. I know HEB has it, our clinic has it. So just sign up and when it comes time to where you meet, meet that criteria, uh, you'll be able to go ahead and get vaccinated. Dr. Erica Gonzalez, President and CEO of South Texas Allergy and Asthma Medical Professionals, our continued prayers for your family. Thank you so much for all you do for this community. Thank you for Thank your time. You. Thank you, doctor. We'll, we'll be right back. back. Got some late breaking news just into our newsroom right now. SAPD telling us a man is now fighting for his life after being shot this evening. Officers say the victim, believed to be in his 20s, was driving a U-Haul with another passenger inside near Henry and Zarzamora when they were approached by a group of five or six men. At some point, the driver was shot and he and the passenger were able to drive to Laurel where they uh, called for help. And the victim was later taken to the hospital and is said to be in critical condition. A motive in this case is still unclear. No suspects have yet been apprehended. We can tell you that uh, we'll continue following this late breaking news as it develops and we'll get you new details as soon as we have them. Turning now to our weather, pretty uh, calm day out there as we give you a live look outside city cam, but oh, I am waiting. It's muggy out there today. For the rest of the week, yeah. Yeah, it was humid out there today. You'll notice the humidity again tomorrow. That all changes later this week, and we've got some big changes to talk about here. This evening, though, pretty uneventful. 72 right now. By 11 p.m., we'll be in the mid-60s. Unseasonably warm tonight. Of course, that humidity increasing as well. It's going to lead to a damp start to the day tomorrow, but really good rainfall potential just around the corners. We're going to talk more about that and the much cooler air on the way coming right up. Really right. was nice weather for the holiday. Yeah, a little warmer than I would have liked, but <laughs> it'll do. Yeah, you like it a little on the cooler yes, side this time of year, and your wish will be granted, I yes. think, later this week. You'll definitely notice the big cooling trend by New Year's Eve. Between now and then, we're going to be running above average, but we have really good rainfall potential on the way. And yes, there is that chance of a wintry mix on the backside of the system, but I don't want that to overshadow a drought denting rain that's headed our way. So let's talk about all of it here, starting with the overall weather pattern. Quite across the state today, we had some drizzle this morning. We'll repeat that again tomorrow and really the next couple of mornings, and we'll have a few sprinkles here and there. But our weather pattern is starting to really awaken. You look at this big upper level swirl over the southwestern U.S., bringing widespread rain to California and even parts of the desert region. That's our next system. This is going to dig even farther south, and that's going to really put us in the place of good energy aloft. That's going to lift our air and give us what's looking like some widespread rainfall. And this is an unusually far south upper level system. We don't often see them dig down into central Mexico, but this one's going to. So let's just look at our future cast. I think it gives us a good general idea of what to expect going forward. Tomorrow, mainly cloudy, 
little bit of dampness, some morning drizzle and a few sprinkles here and there. We get into Wednesday, some scattered activity, scattered showers and even a few thunderstorms on Wednesday and then Wednesday night. That's our biggest potential for rainfall Wednesday night into early Thursday morning is when we're expecting the most widespread shower activity. And as we go throughout Thursday, we're going to pull in some colder air from the north. And as our temperatures start to drop on Thursday, we could actually see a little transition into some wet snowflakes, especially I think closer to the Rio Grande and in parts of the hill country. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to make a snowman out of this, right? But there could be that gee whiz factor, some wet snowflakes, maybe some minor accumulations on some grassy surfaces here and there where that rain snow line sets up, of course, is the big determining factor. And that's going to come down to very detailed specifics that will come more into light in the days ahead. So bottom line here is, yeah, we could have a little bit of a wintry mix toward New Year's Eve, but the main headline is this good rainfall potential. We're looking at one to two inches in the forecast right now of rain uh, through Thursday. OK, so some good drought denting rain in the farther east you go of San Antonio, the higher the potential we will probably have closer to two inches or more in parts of Lavaca County. And as you head east into Houston, as for the timing, let's go over this one more time tomorrow. A few sprinkles, a little bit of drizzle. Wednesday during the day, 40% chance. Wednesday night, we bump that to 80% chance. Thursday to start the day, fairly scattered in nature, and then the rain, the rain chances really fall off and the precip chances fall off as we progress through Thursday. Colder air, it's going, to, it's going to greet us though. Right now in the Panhandle, we're in the 30s and 40s. Meanwhile, 76 in Del Rio, Laredo at 78. We hit 80 degrees in parts of South Texas today, so it's unseasonably warm for now. And tomorrow's going to be the same way above average. We'll be 72 for the high temperature with noticeable humidity in the air. Actually, a bit of mugginess, drizzle, a few sprinkles, some dampness, and a breezy day as well. A southeasterly wind at 15 to 20. Wednesday we will make it up to 70 degrees, but Wednesday night with the more widespread rain temperatures start to drop and we're looking at temperatures only in the lower 40s on Thursday, New Year's Eve. I mean, that's for high temperatures, lower 40s with the low clouds, the rain and that chance of a wintry mix here or there somewhere possibly in South Texas. And then by Friday, New Year's Day, we clear out. We have some sunshine, but it's only going to boost us into the upper 50s and then near 60 into the weekend. So, Isis, I think your wish will be granted yes, later this looking week. looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Adam. I'll take the rain. You yeah. can keep the rest. <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. Good morning and happy Monday, the start of the last week of 2020. It is Woo! Monday, December 28th. New at five's human skeletal remains found at Joint Base San Antonio Fort Sam Houston last night. According to a news release, the remains were found near Salado Creek in the northeast part of the installation by people who were walking by. Man is dead after San Antonio police say a fight broke out overnight at a student housing complex at the Tetro Student Village near UTSA. When officers arrived, they found the man on the ground with severe head injuries. The other man was sitting nearby and told police he was acting in self-defense when he hit the victim, causing him to fall and hit his head on the pavement. We still don't know if that man will face any charges. Racing is believed to be behind a multi-car crash that left several injured, including two kids. We're still not clear on how many cars were involved in the alleged racing, but eight cars ended up crashing. A suicide bombing, that's what authorities are calling the Christmas Day blast that rocked downtown Nashville. 63-year-old Anthony Quinn Warner has been named as the man behind that attack. Investigators now exploring whether Warner may have been motivated, at least in part, by a paranoia over 5G cellular technology. This as authorities review new traffic camera footage showing the moment the RV exploded. More than 40 buildings were damaged in the explosion. One collapsed. Warner was the only one killed in the blast. Investigators now looking into his psychiatric and medical history. 
Well, if you still have some sweet treats hanging around after Christmas, today is the day to focus on chocolate. It is National Chocolate Candy Day. Any kind of candy, as long as it has, ch has chocolate in it counts. Chocolate, which comes from the tropical cacao tree, has been around for thousands of years, according to National Calendar Day. But just in beverages until 1828, that's when a Dutch inventor and chemist figured out how to make chocolate in solid form by removing the cocoa butter from the cacao. The first box of chocolate was made in 1842. Five years later, in 1847, sugar was added to create the popular chocolate treats we now know today. Get this, Americans eat about 12 pounds of chocolate every year. Plus five for me. <laughs> <laughs> and Forrest Gump making it so poetic as well, yeah. right? Changing the box of chocolates forever. All right, looking at our day tomorrow, we'll have low clouds, drizzle, some sprinkles, a little bit of afternoon sun, but warm, 74 and humid. Wednesday, the wind kicks up a little bit more, cold front moves in. We'll still make it to 70 degrees, but we'll have some scattered rain, maybe a few thunderstorms. Wednesday night is our greatest potential for widespread rain, and we can see a couple of inches of rain, especially east of San Antonio. Uh, by the time it's all said and done into Thursday afternoon and look at Thursday, only 42 for the high with uh, some of that moisture there in low clouds. All right, thank you, Adam, and thanks for watching the 6 o'clock news. We'll see you for the night beat tonight after the NFL game. Have a good evening.